Okay, welcome to Wood Talks, everybody. Good morning. Um, our presenter today is Kelly Marcini. Kelly is the Vice President of Panagold International. And Kelly is also a board member with the BC Log and Timber Builders Industry Association. Kelly strives to educate home and resort property owners about the long-term sustainability benefits of solid log construction. Welcome, Kelly. Excellent. Thank you so much, Ken. Um, and thank you for, for hosting Wood Talks um, over this past year. We were, were just chatting about how it's uh, end of the, the fiscal and, and starting a new program next year. So we're looking forward to that. Uh, so as Ken mentioned, so I uh, am working with Panabo, but uh, I'll also speak today uh, generally about log um, buildings uh, from my experience working with the BC Log and Timber Building Industry Association. Uh, so today's topic is specifically on lodges, cabins, and off-grid retreats. So what are some things that are different about designing, building with a prefabricated Western Red Cedar interlocking systems? So as Ken mentioned, uh, we are recording. Um, so if you have any questions, just send them over in the chat. Um, I do have that up, so we'll be able to answer any questions for you and, and happy to discuss with you later on as well if you're wanting to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation about a project um, or any details that you wanted to discuss uh, as well as I'll be able to share the slide deck and then the uh, design guide for architects and designers uh, that Panabot has. I'll share those uh, via email after the session. So learning uh, objectives that we'll be covering today. So um, what are some of the designing and building advantages of using that prefabricated interlocking build systems, uh, particular focus on places that are off grid or remote uh, builds. Uh, talk about different common log species. Well, you know, I do think Western Red Cedar is the, the queen of the woods. Uh, there is definitely some different advantages about other wood species that are commonly used in log structures in Canada. Uh, talked a little bit about sort of the process of, of making a machine milled log home and some of the, touch on a little bit on care maintenance. Um, we'll talk briefly about uh, the whole carbon life cycle of a, a structure um, and why we need to be focusing more um, beyond just operating emissions. And then we'll finish up specifically talking about architectural design guidelines, um, some of the different design trends that we're seeing and how those impact uh, your log structures. Okay, so types of re remote buildings, when I talk about them, it's both commercial as well as residential. Um, on the residential side, you know, depending on where you're located, they may be called cabins, cottages, camps, uh, going to the lake. Uh, you know, we are seeing also wilderness getaways. And then there is a bit of a trend even before COVID is with second homes and people retiring into remote or rural locations but often they're bringing a lot of the same amenities that they're used to in, a, in an urban you know, household that they had before. So um, that's definitely something that's a, a little bit changing um, where yes, the rustic cabin uh, where you go away to retreat, but now we're also thinking about uh, wider hallways and doorways and turning radiuses for, for wheelchairs as people age in place, um, you know, modern conveniences that uh, people wanna have in, in their structures. And then on the commercial side, same thing, you know, with Panboat over the years, we have seen uh, it evolved where previously when we thought of a, a lodge or, or a retreat in the wilderness, it was typically hunting or, or fishing were the two main activities. Um, now we're seeing wilderness nature getaways, photography, uh, yoga, health, uh, meditation retreats. So it's, it's definitely expanded. Uh, the type of commercial, uh, you know, structure that uh, suits this sort of off-grid and remote, um, as well as things like ranger stations and, and more general resorts to where um, there may be a variety of activities taking place. With remote build projects is a, a few different challenges uh, that occur. So um, one of them is figuring out how you actually get to site. Um, you know, is that it, trucking available, maybe only part of the way, uh, then looking at barges, helicopter drops. And for some really challenging site, there may be the last, you know, 100 meters or, or further, that's actually walk-in only um, to it. So having a, a system that's prefabricated is going to be a huge advantage uh, to these situations. And then in particular for something that's uh, walk-in only, 
having something that doesn't require large equipment or cranes um, and pieces that are easily handled by you know two or three people um, are key. So that's where a log system that's yeah, prefabricated really starts to see an advantage over you know panelized or, or large zip panels uh, for it. Uh, do talk to whoever you're supplying with is uh, what actually is included in that package. So again, everything, if you can simplify logistics, getting to a remote location is gonna be advantage to you. Uh, so, you know, in the case of Panabode, we supply all the materials for the lockup stage of construction, including a lot of trim materials and interior doors, hardware and so forth. So you get a fairly complete build uh, without having to deal with a, a lot of different deliveries and different suppliers. Uh, talk to your supplier about how they package up materials um, and weight. So um, you know, thinking about what your offloading equipment will, will be on site, um, you know, with helicopters, often even time of year is going to impact how much weight that they can have. Barges, tides will, will make an impact. And then obviously, uh, if you're hand carrying things, uh, it might be that you're just actually cutting packages open and, and lifting off individual pieces um, for that last uh, leg of the journey. Uh, just a quick note on, on cedar. So um, one of the things uh, about it is that it is lighter uh, than a lot of the other softwood species that, that are used in log structures. So if you are hand carrying, uh, it does make it easier that way. Um, and then the fact that it is an interlocking system, so it does do much faster turnaround time. So if you do have a crew that's out there and you're paying for accommodations and meals and everything for, the, for them to be on site, um, going to prefabricated where you can turn around the project much faster um, obviously saves you, you know, a lot of time as, as well as money on the site and as part of the overall project. And then one thing to, to work with is in the design, um, there's even things in the design that we can do that'll actually make it the, the project go faster or require less equipment. So um, different styles of roof systems, as well as, you know, if it's one or multiple stories are, are going to make an impact uh, for it. So um, you may see this kind of roof ceiling style that we have here with the, the open beams, and then you'll see the cedar decking uh, growing across. Um, you know, you don't need a crane or heavy equipment to install that, um, you know, a couple ladders and, and some people can, can lift it up versus a system using trusses or um, even you know mass timber sheets and so forth where it's just uh, a lot more equipment is required to, to be able to install that. A um, couple things, yeah, remote projects, uh, some of the images there. So one thing here you'll see, uh, this one's all loaded up on a barge here and you can see everything is numbered. Um, so that's one thing that we take a fair bit of care uh, on is all the packages are labeled. Um, every single log is actually labeled as well. So you know when you're putting it together um, that it's in the, the right location and you're putting it in the, in the right order. Um, as well as if you have a very tight building site is that you know which packages you need when. So we'll have them all listed out, you know, packages, you know, 9, 13, and 12 are for subfloor system. Okay, so you need to pull out those ones first and, and work on that first when you're actually on the build site. Items like windows and doors, you know, they'll be all crated, but you'll know that, okay, we can put them in, say, dry storage waiting until we have the rest of the structure ready for them. So it helps you manage on, on the build site as well uh, with it. So lots of different ways to get out your project there. Um, and definitely logistics is going to be one part of it uh, in the overall scheme of things. Uh, with off-grid, so with off-grid, I often uh, will find customers, me, you know, two things that they're kind of going at it is one is people that they are intending to have very minimal electricity, if at all. Um, sometimes it's just LED, solar lights, something like that. Um, and so, you know, getting that, that speed to a lockup shelter is, is really important for them, uh, as well as that are, all the pieces are going to be pre-cut, pre-sanded. A lot of that uh, work that might take uh, tool use on site is eliminated. Um, so, you know, it is ideally, even if you have some hand tools that you can use um, that maybe are, you know, with battery packs, because um, there'll there'll be some drilling, there'll be a little bit of sawing, you know, stain will go faster if you, you spray on. Um, but, uh, you know, this sort of 
yeah, one thing to consider. Um, but if you don't have power on site, these are, are some of the things that uh, are going to eventually help you out. Um, and then if you do have some power, then you're going to be looking at uh, some of the different tools. We do have a, a pretty short tool list uh, of what is required and, and working with your builder or assembly team uh, for that. And then um, also just always check is what actually is required for code. Um, I know we've worked on a number of projects where uh, they think no electricity, okay, I don't have to worry about uh, meeting electrical permits and electrical inspections, um, when in fact that it is still required uh, for it. And you may need to have it sort of electricity ready, uh, even if there's not an intention to, to actually you know, connect it to a, to a grid or a power source. Um, then we have sort of our other type of clients there where when they say off grid, all they mean is they, they're not connected to, to pole power uh, coming up to, to them. They have generators, they have all sorts of backup power, situ, you know, cascading that they're going to be able to use, battery packs, you know, and the, the potential need uh, storage for all of that. In addition to they're expecting all the modern, modern conveniences um, with that. So a very different kind of uh, approach. So I always try to clarify, you know, what truly is meant by off-grid uh, when they say that and, and what that term means and, and how it'll it impact the project. So I don't see any questions uh, in the chat, so I'll just uh, keep sort of going here. Um, talking about next topic is wood species and how they, we actually process and uh, make a, a materials package. So in Canada, the three main species that will be used for uh, log structures will be western red cedar, uh, white pine, and Douglas fir will be the main common ones. Um, log structures and buildings and, and homes have been around for thousands and thousands of years. Um, and typically what's globally what's been used is what's locally available. So that's uh, no different here in Canada where these are commonly you know, grown species in, in different regions. And that's reflected in what is used. So Western red cedar, typically, well, it's only found here on coastal uh, species, sort of British Columbia and a little bit further south. And it is a, a tougher uh, tree to, to grow and it takes longer to, to get large. And so we're definitely seeing that in the, you know, pricing and availability compared to say white pine, which grows readily, it grows rapidly. Um, but it also has some other challenges where it's not, uh, it doesn't, um, the maintenance schedule is, is, long, is uh, more frequent with pine than something like Western Red Cedar, which is naturally resistant to rot and, and mildew and decay. Um, and then you also have sort of in the middle is Douglas fir. Douglas fir is really strong. Um, you know, for Panabo, we actually will use Douglas fir beams in, in our roof system. Um, Currently, mostly a glue laminated, but uh, you know we will do the the full uh, timbers for Douglas fir as well because they do have that extra strength um, compared to the cedar. And so, a, a good guide that you can access is the Canadian Wood Council. Um, I've just included their link down in the bottom, and they actually have a number of different wood species that you can access and learn about. You know, different applications for what does it look like, how does it perform. And so you're able to pick based on your project, what species you're wanting to, to use. And for many different log builders, often they're only working with one, maybe two different species. And so if you have a specific species you wanna use, you may start with that first and to narrow your choices down of, of supplier. Next one is uh, just a quick touch on sustainability um, with it. So I do encourage you to also ask about this when you're talking with your suppliers is where they're sourcing their, their materials from. Uh, typically, if it's gonna be, well, I say almost 100% guaranteed here in British Columbia and Canada, you're gonna be having a sustainable forest uh, management program that it's coming from. You know, we do have fairly stringent laws in Canada uh, related to forestry um, and particularly in, in British Columbia with uh, a very, I would say, professional forestry industry, um, you know, with wood scientists and engineers and um, whole forestry regulated profession uh, that we have here. And we particularly see this as, you know, comparing ourselves to the you know, United States or where they have um, or other parts of the world where 
we're often asked the question, is it legally harvested or, you know, where is it coming from, as well as the avoidance of uh, plantation style uh, growing where it's basically, you know, a monoculture with a lack of other biodiversity uh, that, that's growing there for, you know, wildlife and humans to enjoy and all the other benefits of, of a real forest. And again, lots of resources through naturallywood.com uh, that you can access if you're you know, if you have clients or yourselves that are looking for more information um, on forests in Canada. Uh, next sort of thing here, so we have uh, the forest, we, you know, we're able to harvest and then what ha happens next um, will typically going to be is how do they dry the logs to get it down to the right moisture content. Uh, so uh, a log, once we get it, it could be, you know, 30 plus percent uh, moisture content. And usually you're wanting to get it below 19% um, or even further where you're actually getting the water out of the cells and you're able to have uh, any of that shrinking that might cause uh, checking and cracks and, and other sort of, uh, you know, issues in the wood are dealt with early on uh, before you're actually putting it into the structure. Uh, the BC Log and Timber Building Association did a life cycle analysis study a few years ago looking at different methods of building a log home. Um, so that the hand crafted, the timber frame and the machine milled. And about a third of the impact between these different homes and different styles was just that choice of either air drying or kiln drawing the wood. So the air dry, it's, it does take a long time. Um, you know, Panabode were having uh, timbers that we're buying you know, six to nine or even further more months in advance till we get it down to the moisture content that works for our profile um, versus kiln drying where it's, it's rapid. But one of the challenges because it rapid is that you can uh, get some degrading in the quality of the, the log structure as well as the not quality can degrade where you get something called, called star checks where you get these little cracks and you may be able to get, uh, you know, wood, bugs or water bugs, other things will, will start to kind of get in there um, versus a nice uh, piece of wood that's been air dried and, and doesn't have any cracking or checking into it. So uh, the definitely again, sort of one thing to, to ask and, and be considering, uh, especially as we are having more and more customers are asking for environmentally friendly options uh, that are out there. Um, just a quick yeah, photo here uh, is just air drying for us. We actually have a little machine that tells us the, the moisture content, um, but even just visually when we see them up uh, there that the ones that are still tight with the, the bands, you can tell that they're still a little bit um, you know, swollen with, with moisture and then the bands actually start to loosen as the, the logs will shrink down and we get it down visually, we can kind of see where it is and then we'll use our little uh, moisture meter to actually get the actual moisture content before we send it for profiling. So let's talk about profiles. So that'll be the other thing. Uh, so you talk about wood species, sort of narrowing down your choice of supplier. Uh, the next one would be your log profile. Um, often, uh, maybe again, one, maybe two different profiles uh, that a log supplier will do. Um, and these are the most common ones that are out there. So Swedish Cope and round, um, you know, as the, the name size will have that round uh, look, look to it. You will, uh, if it's machine milled, it will be a pretty you know, smooth surface. Um, and then if, as soon as you're gonna have that hand crafting uh, to it, you're gonna have the, the different marks or the tools uh, for it. Then you're gonna have your D log. Um, I always call this the compromise log. Uh, so you have the round down on one side that usually goes to the exterior and then you're going to have your flat on the other side and that's usually on the interior uh, of the, the home. And then you have your square log or rectangle log, um, typically going to have flat sides. In the case of Panabode, we have a slight profile uh, to it and we find that actually sheds water. And then on the far uh, side here is our handcrafted. And with a handcrafted, you, a lot of different styles that are out there. Um, you know, it is very much an art. Uh, so picture here shows different diameters of logs. Um, sometimes they'll have very even uh, where all the logs are roughly the same size. And you also can have all sorts of different ends. Um, you know, in this case, if they're gonna just be a flat cut, 
Other times you'll see something where they have a, a burl or, um, you know, you actually see some of the root structure that's still attached. Uh, so th there's some really neat things that you can do there if you're wanting to something that's, uh, you know, quite special um, with the handcrafted. And then this is also a good example where you can see where I was talking about uh, these cracks that it can occur um, in the structure. So these uh, cracks here are part of the natural drawing. And a lot of the handcrafted, they will do something that they'll call force a check, where they will force a check to occur in a specific location uh, that works best for the overall structure. And then you can put some sort of gasketing or insulation uh, into there. Uh, another way of doing it with, uh, which is the approach that Panabo takes, is that we do our logs as only as free of heart center. So we're only taking the outside edges around the log and instead of uh, when it's drying, it'll sort of dry like this, and then you may get a crack uh, occurring. Our logs are only gonna be uh, off to the side here with the free of heart center. And so we'll just get a bit of a vertical uh, as it dries. And so we'll have a little bit of shrinkage, but we're not gonna get that cracking issue that uh, occurs with some of the round logs or logs that um, you know, use the, the heart center um, within their product. So the machine milling, um, modern factories uh, are used. So, uh, you know, it'll be a uniform shape. It's gonna have a precise fit. Um, it's not uh, like the handcrafted are usually pre-built, um, put all together on site and then disassembled and then uh, reassembled on, on the project site. With the machine milled, uh, they skip that whole step. So there's no pre-assembly required we know everything's gonna fit because it has a precise fit um, actually down to a, a millimeter uh, tolerance that we have. And so that quality control is there as well as that speed of manufacturing uh, that uh, we can do you know, fairly voluminous uh, projects um, because we're using this modern factory and, and machinery that we have. So we'll go into the, a few of the different uh, build systems. So once you've, um, harvested the wood, you've dried it, you've profiled it. Uh, now you have going into how you're actually going to assemble the, the structure uh, with it. So these are the most common uh, styles that we see. And there's lots of variation here. Uh, again, going back, you know, log structures have been around for thousands and thousands of years. So um, lots of people, ways people have come up with and some pretty fancy joinery that you can do. Um, but these are the most common ones that you'll, you'll probably be coming across. So button pass is the most simple. It actually uses two different lengths of logs. And once it's, uh, instead of going over or locking in place, it actually just sits with gravity over top. And then you're gonna have your next one uh, and one on top of the other going back and forth. And then as the name implies, they butt up against that other alternative one. So it, you have a pass and then a butt and then a pass and then a butt. Um, typically, you're going to have some more hardware here because, you know, there is a possibility that these things will come apart because there's not any sort of uh, joinery keeping them together. And so, you, you know, that is uh, fairly simple, but, uh, you know, there's sometimes uh, simple isn't always uh, necessarily the best because you're going to have this other hardware um, that is required. Um, next one over is saddle notch. So saddle notch typically uses the Swedish cope uh, log profile where you're gonna have your round profile and then you have a bit of a crescent shape taken out of the bottom. And then so it nice and fits on top of the log below it. And then you're able to pass another log over top. And so instead of, there's no but, um, logs that butt against each other, they're all passing over one over the other um, with it. The next one down on the uh, bottom corner here is our corner post. A corner post is where, as the name implies, you're gonna have a post and then you're gonna have, uh, usually there's gonna be some sort of slotting uh, or notches uh, that are done. And then your logs are gonna be coming down uh, into them that way. Uh, next one over is your dovetail. Your dovetail, uh, as the name implies, there is kind of a, a tail uh, that's coming off of it. And so it's wider on the end. And so when you have the next log going over top, it, it makes it very challenging for it to pull apart um, because you're at basically acting like a stopper on the end there. Um, this is when you're, you're definitely going to see some different uh, variation uh, on in, in different styles. And then you have your interlocking, where it's a bit of a combination of the saddle notch and the dovetail, 
Um, but you are going to have uh, cutouts both on the top and the bottom. And so when it comes together, it, it locks in place and it is actually very challenging to pull it apart. Uh, if you're wanting to take it apart, you basically have to start at the top and just take off one course after another and work your way down to, to whatever log it is. Um, like if you yeah, put one in the wrong place or, or something there. Just, yeah, quick one, how, how it all kind of fits together there. Um, everything will be all pre-cut. And so, you know, including openings for archways and, and windows and doors uh, will all be in place. Um, so when you're putting it together, you know, pieces will be cut already for, for those openings. Okay, seeing uh, if there's any questions, definitely feel free to, to drop them in the chat. Um, I will endeavor to answer them as we go here. Um, so. Care, now you've built the structure, uh, now you got to take care of it. So again, going back to us being a remote and, and potentially off-grid uh, site, so care mean it's going to obviously be challenging if it's not easy to get a crew to, to go out there and, and do quick little touch-ups. Uh, so having a, a structure that um, you know kind of takes care of itself, so to speak, uh, is going to obviously be an advantage for you. Um, for the care maintenance, uh, one thing to think about is log profile. So often we kind of hear from people that have had round logs in the home previously is that debris kind of can build up on it. So you may get more dusting um, on the outside. You may get more leaf debris and other things that are accumulating on it uh, versus the square logs where it'll just shed that naturally. Uh, a point about staining. Um, nowadays, we definitely do recommend giving it a stain uh, even on the outside to protect it for, from UV and, and water. Um, on the inside, it's, it's more common to do a clear coat, um, particularly washrooms, kitchens, any high touch, high traffic areas. Um, and then on the graying, that is one thing that people really like about cedar is that it does do that naturally sort of silvery gray. And there's even products that you can get that actually stain it a very similar color, but still provide that UV and water protection for the, the longevity of the product. Um, but if you do have a project that they do just leave natural, um, you know, cedar is going to be the one that's going to be lasting the longest in those type of environment, uh, as well as it, it will actually quite nicely, you know, giving it a sand and, and opening that back up and then giving it a stain, then you can actually uh, revive an, an older uh, cedar structure. Um, yeah, with pretty good results uh, for it. Um, point on seasoning uh, is something that uh, you may hear that a settling seasoning, you know, the drying of a structure. Um, so we talked about air drying or kiln drying to get down to a set moisture content. Once it actually gets into the build site, it's been put together and now you're heating it on the inside, you are going to get a little bit more shrinkage. Um, and that'll kind of depend on a number of factors. Um, for the Panabode log system, you know, with our four by six uh, West Red Cedar logs, we're going to have a, maybe another ha uh, eighth of an inch. Uh, per log that's going to occur. And so we have a natural or built in ability for the structure to handle that settling. And so you'll have a little bit different details around windows, around doors, around the roof system uh, to accommodate that. As well as there's going to be these through bolts uh, that'll be going from um, just sort of the roof line and coming all the way down uh, through the structure and, and it'll come up through the bottom. And nowadays we have a self-tightening bolt. So, you know, you, there's no more having to go, you know, people are familiar with old panaboats where you had a little screw system where you went and hand tightened. Uh, it now does it for you. So you're not having to worry about that. Um, particularly locations where there is a big moisture content between different seasons, you can get a bit of that shrinkage and swelling that's occurring, um, you know, even well, you know, years after the, the initial drying of the structure. Um, windows, doors, roof, foundation, obviously those are all different components um, to the structure as well that may have their own care maintenance schedules. Um, and typically they're going to be pretty similar to, you know, other conventional uh, structures that you may have come across. Um, another good plug for an industry resource is realcedar.com. And uh, they have a whole bunch of resources on care maintenance of cedar uh, that you can access. So uh, a good one to, to share with your team. Okay, so we'll just briefly touch about this. I know uh, this is 
you know, I've heard definitely a lot of people are, are, are learning about this more now. And um, I wouldn't say it's not always the elephant in the room <laughs> anymore. So we've been really good on operating carbon. You know, we're trying to reduce our energy consumption in structures, really sort of thinking about, you know, high R value and um, heat pumps and a number of these types of things. Um, however, we do also need to think about the sequestering carbon uh, potential that happens with uh, log structures, as well as the embodied carbon. So the embodied carbon is all of that carbon that's actually uh, used within the, the creation of that structure, as well as eventually you know, decommissioning it. So this is kind of the cycle um, that we go through here. We starting with the, the raw materials. So in the case of uh, wood structure, it's actually sequestering while it's growing. And then you're gonna have your harvesting and then all the way through your transport, you know, the manufacturing that's occurring, transport, construction to site. Um, again, because it's prefabricated, you're gonna actually have less transport, less materials all the way, less material you're gonna have to haul out uh, as well. Then you're gonna have the eventual deconstruction of the structure. So what happens at end of life? Um, long buildings are well known for being able to have an extended longevity. That's often why they're called a legacy uh, structure. So it's something that, you know, in families, they give on to their children and grandchildren. Um, you know, a lot of the, the resorts and lodges and stuff, they do see this as sort of a showcase or a piece that they can have for a long time um, through the, um, the life of, of the property. And uh, a neat thing with log structures, a lot of it can be reused. Um, so we're definitely, you know, with Panabode, uh, we're seeing probably, I'd say at least once a month, uh, you know, a project coming through where they're gonna be doing some de deconstruction um, for the, the project and then reusing the logs, either rebuilding exactly the same or, you know, with modifications that uh, we can help them plan. And then, yeah, then you have your operating. So actually what's the, the structure, what energy kind of use is, is it having? Um, everything from heating, cooling, ventilation, uh, you know, lighting, um, all of the other things that, that come into there. Okay. So sequester carbon. Um, yeah, so if, if people don't sort of know what that is, so it's uh, just actually how the plants um, use and create energy. So they'll actually absorb uh, carbon. Uh, so they'll absorb carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere and they use it actually in their growth. So through photosynthesis, they separate out uh, the carbon and the oxygen. The oxygen is a, is a waste that they expel. Uh, great for animals because we actually use that um, you know, opposite uh, cycle to, to bring in to our bodies. And then that rest of that carbon is actually used as a building material, just like we use it as a building material, uh, trees and plants use it as a building material that it's in their leaves, it's branches, it's roots uh, system, you know, everything is, is, is made of carbon there. Uh, typically it's about 50% uh, of the weight um, of, uh, you know, a log or a structure is, or um, a wood structure is going to be uh, carbon in there. And it's going to be stored in there until it either burns or composts. Um, so this is why when people talk about uh, the best value or the best use of a, a forestry product, where they're looking for long life products. So if you're able to sequester and then store that carbon in buildings, furniture, infrastructure, that uh, stores it much longer than using it for um, you know, disposable products like tissues and, and biofuels and all these kind of things where you know, it goes quite rapidly. Um, through the cycle. So <clears throat> every tree should be used, you know, best value of what we can get out of it um, for the structure. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, on the embodied carbon, I think I covered most of that there. Um, lots of good researchers that, that are out there, uh, particularly that, again, another one with natural wood, um, talking sort of about embodied carbon and, and how that all works and how it relates to infrastructure. Our uh, operating carbon, um, especially with step code, that's that's definitely the current focus of, of the BC Energy step code that we have. Okay, so for uh, next topic, let's talk about um, let's delve into specifically now uses uh, of wood here in structures. Um, so I'm obviously talking mostly about pan about here. That's that kind of structure and uh, that we have here in the in the bottom. 
<clears throat> but we also have uh, in British Columbia a, a few other good examples of structures that are, you know, I think um, helping us, you know, and buildings and, and uh, you know, construction industry being part of the, the solution. So uh, another good, a tall example is in Vancouver, where we have Tall House uh, at UBC, which is using mass timber. Um, I think it's currently the second tallest structure in the world um, and they're, that's made of wood. And there's a, another one, uh, I think in Japan, that's being built right now that'll be taller. But, uh, you know, I think this is something that British Columbia is definitely taking the lead on. Uh, and as well as large spans, so not just going high, but also going uh, wide. And so up in Prince George, we have the Wood Innovation Center. And as you can see in the picture, some really big wide spans. So you can do some neat things uh, with the, the structures that we have uh, for them. Okay. Talk to, yeah, so we talked about sustainable and uh, that legally harvested wood, um, especially because it is gonna be using less total carbon and concrete, steel, glass, most other building materials there. So um, definitely something to, to sort of go through and calculate um, as, as one more consideration in the overall project. And just to point out, yeah, about wood being a very versatile product. So uh, you'll see I have a couple of photos coming up. I'm going to show of some of these different uh, uses of wood in, in a pan wood structure where so many different materials are actually uh, wood or wood based, um, you know, where instead of using a, a plastic or a metal alternative for it, um, as well as the, let's say the, the waste being an input into others. So Panabo were uh, part of the Aspen Planners group of companies and all, all of our sister companies are all wood value add uh, businesses as well. And some of our waste products are actually, we sell them to our sister company and then their uh, input into their products. And so it's not actually, it's not ending up in landfill, it's actually being reused and just keep uh, circulating um, with it. So that's definitely a neat thing that I like uh, about the wood structures that we have. Uh, another thing is that high efficiency in manufacturing. So um, you definitely gonna be overall using uh, less energy, less carbon output uh, compared to doing onsite construction, which, you know, you know, yes, there's been advances, but uh, it's still inefficient um, compared to what we can do in a manufacturing setting. And then, yeah, I already talked about, you know, the, the waste is going to be different on the, the prefab, uh, as well as pan abodes, as well as other log structures can be deconstruction, deconstructed and reassembled. So there's still value um, in the material, even after the, the end of life of the building. A neat tool. Uh, Canadian Wood Council uh, that has is through a carbon cal calculator. It's actually free to use. Um, you just take your bill of materials and then there's a number of just different uh, sort of prompts that you fill out indicating what wood material it is, you know, the volume that you had and uh, it'll calculate for you creating that structure um, using wood rather than, you know, concrete, steel and other materials. And what's the, uh, both the volume of wood that it gives you, how much carbon is stored in there. And then it also does some little offsets of saying, well, this is the equivalent to taking, you know, so many cars off the road or so many, you know, homes get uh, heated uh, for, for a year. So it gives you a nice um, talking point for your customers as well as the ability to try different things. So if you're wanting to reduce the overall uh, carbon impact of the structure, and then, you know, for a lot of people, cost is obviously still a consideration. You're able to do some different uh, uses and trade off different things there and actually be able to play with the numbers and figure out, okay, it's going to cost me 10% more in material cost, um, but, you know, I'm, I'm reducing our environmental impact by 25%. Bring that case to our customers and they're able to go, okay, yes, that, that makes sense for me. This is something that I wanted to do. And then we're able to, you know, continue to go on forward with the project. Okay, so I see um, the question here just about pricing. Um, so, uh, yeah, so what I can do, it's, hey, it, it ranges a lot, uh, depending on what kind of structure you're doing. So we do have uh, homes that are, and buildings that are almost all cedar. Uh, all exterior walls, all interior walls, the whole entire roof system, 
Um, and that's going to be, I'd say, our, our most expensive per square foot um, that you're going to be having. And then you're going to have your structures that uh, we do have a system that uses uh, framed interior walls and then a truss roof. And so you're going to then finish, um, you know, either drywall or we do have cedar siding or, or V joint that you can cover with it. But uh, that's a, a way to kind of keep some of the material costs down. So, yeah, there's going to be more labor costs of actually putting it together. Um, usually we work out in the same ballpark as a custom framed home. Uh, but you're going to be spending more money on materials and less money on labor uh, to actually get it uh, assembled and, and built. And then for um, and then you're going to have your finishing costs on top of that. So things like counters, flooring, lighting, electrical fixtures, plumbing, all that type of stuff um, will be sort of separate. And that's those prices are pretty standard of, of whatever else you're going to have um, as a comparable type of structure. And then if you had any particular um, homes that you, if you had a, <clears throat> a project you wanted us to price out for you, we're happy to do custom rough estimates. And uh, before we actually get into, you know, custom designing something, we can just take a sketch, we can go, okay, this is a ballpark of, of how much it's going to be. Um, happy to do that with your projects or talk with you um, about some other specific uh, designs that you may see on our website, um, you know, as a starting point uh, as well. So we kind of approach it two different ways, uh, depending on your needs. Okay, perfect. Okay, so trends and styles that we're seeing here. So this is a, a, a great uh, report. Actually, the American Institute of Architecture does these quarterly surveys, and the results they actually publish for free. Um, they, I think it's something about 6,000 responses that they usually get. So it's quite a, you know, it, it's, a, it's a good sample size to kind of go through of what's uh, happening there. Um, so no surprise there, home offices have, have been on the increase, um, you know, a big part of it coming from COVID, um, but also some of it, those trends we were already seeing. So I talked about these, you know, people from urban environments moving into to rural where they're often bringing in, you know, modern conveniences such as a home office for it. This outdoor living is very popular uh, with log home uh, structures and, and buildings where they want that kind of indoor outdoor space uh, that we achieve uh, with lots of French doors or terrace doors um, and wide uh, verandas and porches and decks uh, space so people can kind of have that, that feel of going back and forth. Uh, mud rooms are really popular. Uh, so typically we're seeing a lot of cold environments where they're, you know, it's snowy conditions, but uh, even in places where it's raining a lot, um, it's kind of nice to be able to come in, you know, get, get rid of the wet clothes uh, before going into rest of structure. It's also really good for energy efficiency too, of kind of having a, that airlock uh, where you're kind of coming into one room, have that other door closed, um, you know, clo close the outside door before you're making your way uh, the rest of the way in. And then that sort of sunroom, three season porch, uh, again, very, very popular in a lot of the log home designs. A lot of these things I think are applicable to any kind of structure, but uh, it is something again, we, we're seeing as well. So that first floor primary bedroom um, or having that master suite um, on the main floor, wider hallways, wider doorways. So just generally that aging in place um, considerations. Uh, it's actually something Panabo, we've actually put together a little checklist of things for people to consider because we are getting in the question more and more. And then um, I mentioned easy to use features handles. Uh, Panabo, we provide hardware in our kits and lever handles are actually the style that we use as our, our uh, base, but um, there's some other choices that you have there too. Okay. Uh, on different styles uh, of homes. So mentioning just cust, uh, contemporary home styles. So log uh, homes and, and structures, people often think of them as being traditional or classic, um, but there's actually a lot of contemporary that you can do there. Um, Panabode for our 70th anniversary, we actually launched a contemporary series um, and actually have, yeah, it's probably almost 50-50 now that we do a contemporary home uh, versus a more traditional style. And particularly with the square or rectangle size logs, it does have that kind of modern, you know, sleek look to it. So, um, so different flexibility and, and styles that you can have. 
front porches, side porches, again, very common with us. Um, that custom design, that is what we do. Most log buildings are custom done. Um, so you do have a lot of flexibility there in what you're trying to have for the overall project. Um, yeah, simple detailing and then yeah, single story homes, which I think is often related to that aging in place. I uh, just wanted to touch on windows on, uh, you know, number and size. I, for us, we're seeing two different trends. Uh, we see people going smaller windows. So thinking about energy efficiency and having a small window to wall ratio. Um, the other one that we're seeing is big walls of windows and people spending still high performance windows that they want and spending a larger portion of their budget on having those windows. So uh, some neat things that we can do with log structures is often having a, a framed loft or second story, which means we can put much larger windows as well as rake windows and, and some you know round windows and some different designs there. So um, windows are definitely something that we're seeing change on, but kind of going in two different, different ways, um, at least for the projects that we've been doing in the last few years. Okay, uh, talk, let's talk a little bit about thermal performance. Uh, so you've probably very familiar with R values or RSI. And uh, what we're doing is um, wood is much better than concrete and steel and a lot of the other assemblies that you, that you can have there. Um, and then so the BC Log and Timber Building Industry Association, uh, just over the last couple of years, has been doing some new research with Natural Resources Canada on, in, particularly for cold weather environments, what is the actual effective uh, value of the different log assemblies? And so they looked at um, five different assemblies in a few different sizes of Western Red Cedar and Douglas Spur. And they actually found the results being 20 to 40% better for the R value than what was previously given through the uh, hotbox testing back in the 1950s. It was the last time that was, this was done on a large scale. And uh, so in a typical home, you're looking at a, a, you know, an energy efficiency score improvement of anywhere from two to 6%. So that can mean a difference of, you know, are you gonna be a step three home or you know, are you going to be pushing yourself into a step four? And uh, so if you are wanting to license those, you can just contact the BC Log and Timber Industry Association and they can actually, uh, they got a licensing agreement and stuff that you could, can work with them to get it either per project or on an annual or, or lifetime basis, uh, depending on yeah, what works for your firm. So that's definitely sort of something to, to think about. Um, the other sort of thing there is thermal mass, which is not used in the calculations uh, for you know BC Energy step code. Um, and I actually don't am aware of actually any of the codes that will use that K value calculation, but it is real. <laughs> it is something we over and over uh, hear from our customers is the warmth that they feel, as well as the um, uh, the heat is more consistent. So instead of having kind of hot pockets or having um, you know, the furnace turning on and off, on and off with the, the frame construction, having that big thick layer of log around them actually retains that heat and will radiate it back um, you know, into the night uh, with it. So definitely places where there's a big temperature change between you know, daytime and nighttime, is, it's even more felt, but uh, this is something that's gonna be impacting most structures you know, in, in yeah, Canada for sure. Uh, natural movement, I've, I've mostly covered here. So talking about uh, settling movement, um, I just wanted to talk about color changes as well as sounds and scents. Um, so with scents, cedar does have a smell. Um, so if your customer or client is not uh, used to cedar or hasn't come across it, uh, definitely talk to us. We have um, these kind of actually slices off of our logs that we have. and. Uh, they smell wonderful. Uh, so if you're uh, wondering, you know, okay, this cedar is something that I, I can uh, want a, as an overall structure and would be smelling on a regular basis, you know, do talk to us. You know, I can source uh, some of these for you, for your client, as well as if they wanted larger pieces, like um, some of our architecture architects we work with, we actually will provide them kind of bigger pieces of log so they can kind of see how, how things fit together as well. Um, but that's all... Yeah, something we can go there. And then sound, 
you will with the movement sometimes get some creaks and some groans um, as the structure moves and that that's normal uh, that's just part of, of a log structure and building that you're going to have and then that, those color changes so i talked a bit about uh, that silvering that will happen over time uh, with the cedar but uh, again a lot of people think that's you know quite uh, attractive too Yeah, just this briefly just kind of showing like so much wood um, <laughs> in a structure that uh, that we have. Okay, our, our design guide. Uh, so this is something we did we developed from in, uh, feedback that we had from architects we were working on is that they um, appreciated that we would take one of their designs and convert it into the Panabo building system. Uh, but some of them actually wanted to play around with it themselves. They wanted to use the building system and come up with their own designs. And so that's where our design guide, um, you know, came from. So it kind of goes through all the different um, guides, as well as in some case rules that you need to follow, uh, such as size of, of openings, you know, spacing of where logs, you know, intersect, all of that uh, for you, as well as some of the other different, um, you know, components that would be going into the structure. It kind of outlines. Uh, different material choices and colors and things that you can choose from. So it's a really good sort of starting place. You're able to kind of go through with your client and actually come up with a, you know, a unique design that works for them. We're still going to to go through it and actually, you know, potentially redraw it. Um, you know, that is something that, you know, we want to obviously make sure that, you know, there were no little details were missed. Um, but it's a really good starting point for you to, to work with and, and have your own creativity stamped right on it. And this is something I'm going to share with you uh, after. Uh, so not only the slide deck, but I'll, I'll share the design guide with you as well. So we're just going to talk through a, a few projects here. Um, and again, happy to answer questions in the chat uh, that, that you may have along the way here. Uh, so this is a, a design that we did where uh, we worked with an architect that they came up with a design for, for the client. And they already had another pan abode on that property. So they went into it going that they were going to want to have a pan abode structure. Um, but they did a lot of, of different things with it. So one of them is what they call a hybrid design here, where we do have some timber framing uh, as part of the structure. They've also used some different exterior finishes where we've done uh, what we call framed gables. Um, so instead of doing a log gable, uh, they've done framing. And then they've done this different uh, type of material the burnt shakes uh, going across it. And then you'll see, uh, yeah, huge deck space as well. So uh, Panabo can, well, we will always design a, a deck into the, the structure and uh, and then, yeah, supplying the materials will be just a, an optional accessory. Um, but we do great decks too, even though I'm, I'm trying to tell you about homes here and, and buildings, but uh, our decks in Western Red Cedar. And uh, yeah, so this large structure here, really big on the, on the patio, lots of gla glazing space uh, for it. And then they did a different kind of ceiling finish as well. So instead of getting the, the cedar finish from us, they just did a white pine uh, where they ended up just painting it. So they had a really bright uh, interior, um, all being white here, and a lot of different finishes um, on the walls as well. They've done a lot of stone uh, treatments. So in this project here, so another one, this is a, a remote uh, location that was a, an island build. Um, just a coastal here. So one of the things that they did is really widened out uh, the soffits uh, coming off of the eave side. And uh, so they could actually walk through around the whole structure without getting rained on. So that was uh, part of it is sort of thinking through the, the use of the, the building um, over time. And they had a focus on these large windows um, there. So we did a framed uh, upper story and so they could put these large rake windows and in, uh, into that structure. And you can just see the, them in from the inside. And again, you know, this one, they did a drywall ceiling um, rather than doing the, the V joint or the cedar decking. So lots of flexibility that you can do in your designs. So this one here uh, was just highlighting some of the different styles of beam work, uh, this one. So they went uh, much more rustic and so sourcing uh, different logs, materials to, to hold up this deck system. And you'll see, I'm not sure if I, on the interior as well, railings and the staircase, uh, again, were a very rustic, um, you know, mix of the, the sleek panabode logs and then that handcrafted uh, look of some of the larger log uh, feature areas. 
just the different roof system there, as well as a lot of the other uh, wood detailing here in, in the doors and the trim and, the, and uh, throughout the structure that we have. Yeah, and actually one other one we often get questioned about is uh, crown molding as well as baseboard. So um, for the crown molding, uh, our standard will be a, a quarter round, a nice thick quarter round that'll be going around. Um, but some people will actually upgrade and do a, a wider um, trim. And so that in cedar, that's something that we can work with you on. And then around the base, again, usually will people are included in our package will be uh, the quarter round going around uh, where the log wall meets the, the floor. Um, but again, we can do that if you're wanting to have a, a thicker baseboard to go around to. So lots of lots of flexibility there and uh, details. So I think we're, we're just uh, close on time here. So happy to answer other questions uh, for you. Feel lots of different ways to, to reach out and, and connect with us. Um, and yeah, thank you very much for, for joining us on, on Wood Talks and uh, learning a bit about you know, using prefabricated uh, log building structures. And, and as I say, the queen of wood, uh, Western Red Cedar is definitely one to consider. Thank you very much for your presentation, Kelly. If anybody would like to stick around and speak to Kelly, please do. Also, before you go, I'd like to mention that uh, Panabold is the main sponsor at the Cottage Light Show. It's a national event. Uh, it's virtual this year, March 26, 27, 28. Uh, you go to uh, cottagelight.com and it's free registration and uh, it's a great show. And um, I don't see any more questions, but uh, again, please stick around if you'd like to speak to Kelly and have a great day. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.